In this video, we work our last example um, of uh, the solution of a regular Sturm-Liouville problem. Um, this problem is a little bit different because in the process of solving for the eigenvalues, we have to solve a transcendental equation. So I wanted to give you at least one example of, of a problem like that. So here's a problem statement. It says, compute the eigenvalues and eigenfunctions of the given regular st um, Sturm-Liouville problem. Notice we've got a second order differential equation. Our goal is to find the function f um, that satisfies this equation and these boundary conditions um, and the corresponding value of that real number, um, that real parameter, lambda, right there. So we actually have two unknowns in this equation, f and lambda, and we want to find the, the lambdas and the f's that will satisfy this equation and the boundary conditions at the same time. Um, the values of lambda that correspond to solutions to this boundary value problem are called the eigenvalues of the regular Sturm-Liouville problem. And the corresponding functions for each of those lambdas is called an eigenfunction. We've got infinitely many eigenvalues and we'll have infinitely many eigenfunctions. And as n goes to infinity, the eigenvalues will go to infinity. And it turns out that the eigenfunctions are going to um, be uh, form an orthogonal set which just means if we integrate a product of the of two of those eigenfunctions that are not exactly the same, but two, two um, distinct eigenfunctions over the interval um, from zero to one, if we integrate that product, we're gonna get zero every time for any, any two of the eigenfunctions in our solution. Okay, so that's what we're looking for. And I think you guys know the drill. If you're watching this video, you've probably seen us work some other um, problems. But let's, let's look at this particular problem so we can see an example where we've got a transcendental equation. So we start these in, in pretty much the same way every time. We start by solving the differential equation. So we've got f double prime plus lambda times f equals zero. And um, remember, lambda is just some real parameter. Since that's a real number, this is just a number times f double prime plus a number times f equals zero. So we're dealing with a homogeneous linear ordinary differential equation with constant coefficients. And to solve that, we know from our elementary differential equations class or an ordinary differential equations class that if we're looking for a solution of a differential equation with constant coefficients and it's homogeneous and all of that, we're talking about this type of equation, we should let the solution take the form e to the mx. And for some values of m, this function will satisfy that equation. To figure out which values of m will cause this function to satisfy this equation, we just take the derivative twice and we substitute into the equation. The derivative of e to the mx is e to the mx times the derivative of the inside. The derivative of a constant times x is the constant. And then if we take the derivative again, we're doing that because we've got a second order differential equation there. We need a second derivative. You bring your constant down and then you multiply by the derivative of e to the mx. Derivative of e to the mx is e to the mx times the derivative of the inside, which is an extra m. m times m is m squared. So we substitute into the equation. Now it won't be a differential equation anymore. So we'll just write equation here rather than de. Um, but if f is a solution of this differential equation, then the following would have to be true. f double prime, which is m squared times e to the mx, plus lambda times e to the mx would have to be zero. So I'm just substituting, but remember we're saying if this is a solution or if f is a solution to this equation, then this algebraic equation involving m has to be true. So the values of m that satisfy this equation are the values of m that cause e to the mx to be a solution of the differential equation. Okay, so we're gonna simplify from here by factoring out that exponential. Exponentials are never zero. So we have uh, this equation right here. It's a second degree polynomial or a quadratic equation involving that um, variable m, that value m that we're, we're looking to solve for. That's called the characteristic equation of our differential equation. 
So let me just write out the steps. We let f equal e to the mx. We computed f prime and f double prime, and then we substituted into the differential equation. And then we simplified and we ended up with this characteristic equation. Now our goal is to find the two values of m that satisfy this equation. So we'll subtract lambda from both sides. And then to get rid of that squaring function, we'll take the square root of both sides. Don't forget the plus or minus on the right. And so we have m1 and m2 are equal to plus or minus the square root of negative lambda. Now, you might be saying to yourself, okay, that must be a complex conjugate root. Wait a minute. Um, this can actually be um, a complex conjugate pair. Um, this can be um, a distinct or two distinct real roots, or and it can also be um, a repeated real root. Um, the, the relationship between M1 and M2 really depends on the value of lambda. So you have to think about the possible cases, like when would we be dealing with distinct real roots versus a repeated real root versus a complex conjugate uh, pair of roots. Um, and that actually corresponds to when the expression under the radical is positive, zero, and negative, respectively. So let's look at case number one. We'll have distinct real roots or distinct values of M1, distinct real values of M1 and M2 if the square root of negative lambda is a real number. Now, that'll be a real number if negative lambda is positive. And if negative lambda is positive, that's equivalent to saying, or that implies actually that um, lambda itself must be negative. So when lambda is negative, we've got distinct real roots. Now, if lambda happened to be zero, we'd have M1 and M2 are plus and minus the square root of the opposite of zero, which is just zero. So we'll have just M1 and M2 both equal to zero. And that'll happen when the expression under the radical is zero. And then finally, we might have complex conjugate roots, a complex conjugate pair of roots when the expression under the radical is negative. So that's when negative lambda is negative, which means that lambda itself must be positive. Okay, so um, those are our three cases. Now we're just gonna go through case by case and look at the solutions. We'll find the general solution in each case to this differential equation. And then we'll say, okay, given that that's true, um, what does, or what would a solution to the boundary value problem be given that F's, f prime of zero minus f of zero is equal to zero and f of one is equal to zero. Um, so, so that's exactly how we handle that. It's case by case. So we've got lambda negative, which corresponds to distinct real roots. Now, if, if lambda is negative, let's let um, lambda star be negative one times lambda, uh, then lambda star will be positive. In that case, m1 and m2 are equal to plus and minus the square root of lambda star. And those are our distinct real roots. In that case, there are many ways that we could state the general solution, but we always get two linearly independent solutions to a second order differential equation. The first one is e to the m1x or e to the 
positive square root of lambda star times x. The second solution is e to the m2x. So it's going to be e to the negative square root of lambda star times x. Okay, I want you to notice that this is e to the kx and e to the negative kx. Now we've talked about this before in other videos. If you'd like, you can watch that um, for more detail. Um, but I can take a linear combination of these and come up with two other linearly independent solutions. So I'm, I'm just going to put a little star on these. I'm not going to use these as my F1 and F2. I'm going to use those to, to come up with an F1 and F2. I'm going to let my first solution, F1, um, be um, the hyperbolic sine of the square root of lambda sub star times x. Um, and that would be uh, one half of e to the square root of lambda sub star times x minus e to the negative square root of lambda sub star times x. And again, that's just using this fact that we've used in many videos already that the hyperbolic sine of x is e to the x minus e to the negative x times one half. Um, so as soon as I see a combination like that, e to a constant times x and e to the same constant times x multiplied by negative one, I think, well, I could use those solutions or it might be more convenient. Um, the computation might be easier if we write everything in terms of our hyperbolic functions. Um, so that's what I'm choosing to do here. Um, so we're going to use this, this as our first linearly independent solution hyperbolic sine of this square root of lambda sub star. And we can do that because we know that if F1 star and F2 star are solutions, then any linear combination of those is a solution. We studied that and discussed that in our ordinary differential equations class. This is just um, one half of F1 minus F2 um, star, both of those. So I've got one half of this function minus one half of this function. That gives us this function. Since that's true, um, this is a, a linearly, or this is a solution to the differential equation. Um, similarly, f sub two of x equals the hyperbolic cosine of the square root of lambda sub star times x. That is, that would be uh, one half of f sub one star plus f sub two star. Um, that is also a solution. And these are linearly independent because I can't multiply this by a function and get this function. Um, there's no way to do that. Um, so we can use these two linearly independent solutions to the differential equation to construct our general solution, but we could also use these. Um, and I would recommend that we use these. So we're gonna use uh, these to construct the general solution. Okay, and then we'll state our general solution of the differential equation. Um, in this case, where lambda is negative would be f of x equals c1 times the hyperbolic sine of the square root of lambda sub star times x plus c2 times the hyperbolic cosine of the square root of lambda sub star times x. And the square root of the lambda um, sub star, remember, it's just the square root of negative lambda where ne uh, lambda is already negative. Okay, um, so that's our general solution. All right, before we go on, I just want to outline our steps here. And we said we're, we're looking at each of these cases separately. Um, we identify that M1 and, I, and M2 in that case We find the corresponding uh, linearly independent solutions, F1 and F2. You could use these. I highly recommend that you use the hyperbolic functions when you have e to the kx and e to the negative kx as your two linearly independent solutions. Use these instead. They can be constructed using those. There's theory from the ordinary differential equations class that says that that's lethal. And then we come up with the general solution, which is F equals C1 F1 plus C2 F2. Okay. All right, so now we've got this, but we're not just looking for a general solution to the differential equation. What we're looking for um, are non-zero solutions 
to this differential equation subject to these initial conditions. So let's use the initial conditions um, to sort of figure out the relationship between C1 and C2. Now I want you to notice with this first initial condition, we've got a derivative of F at X equals zero. So we need to compute F prime. So let's compute F prime. Bring your constant down. The derivative of a hyperbolic sine function is a hyperbolic cosine function. And we've got a constant times X inside. So you get the hyperbolic cosine function evaluated at the inside function times the derivative of the inside. And the derivative of the inside is just that constant. So write it down. The derivative of hyperbolic cosine is hyperbolic sine evaluated at the inside function times the derivative of the inside. The derivative of the inside is that constant. Okay, now for our first initial condition, we have that f prime of zero minus f of zero is equal to zero. So we need to find f prime of zero and we need to find f of zero and then we need to subtract them and set that equal to zero. It's easy enough to do, just a little um, algebra. f of zero is this. We get c1 hyperbolic sine of zero plus c2 hyperbolic cosine of zero. Hyperbolic sine of zero is zero, hyperbolic cosine of zero is one, just like the sine of zero is zero and the cosine of zero is one. Um, so we just end up with a C2 for that. And F prime at zero is square root of lambda sub star times C1 times the hyperbolic cosine of zero plus the square root of lambda sub star times C2 times the hyperbolic sine of zero. And again, hyperbolic cosine of zero is one, hyperbolic sine of zero is zero. So we end up with this lambda times C1. Okay. Now this first initial or first boundary condition says that f prime of zero minus f of zero is equal to zero. So that is the square root of lambda sub star times C1 minus C2 equals zero. Now that is just an equation. It does not tell us the value of C1 and C2. It's one equation with two unknowns. All it tells us is the relationship between C1 and C2. If I wanted to, I could solve this for C2. I would find that C2 is this square root um, of the lambda sub star times C1. Now I know what C2 is in terms of C1, but I still need to figure out what C1 is. Hopefully our second initial condition will allow us to find the value of one of these, and then we can use it, this equation to in, infer the value of the other. Okay, so let's look at our second initial condition. We know that f of one is equal to zero. So we're going to substitute an x equals one here. So I've got f of one is c1 times the hyperbolic sine of the square root of lambda sub star times one, which is just that constant, plus c2 times the hyperbolic cosine of that lambda sub star. And there's no cancellations there. Um, we have to set this equal to zero. So we have this, we know that this is true. Now, if I wanted to, now I've got two equations with two unknowns. Here's one equation with two unknowns and there's a second, or there's one equation with two unknowns, C1 and C2, and there's a second equation with the two unknowns, C1 and C2. Um, we can use a substitution method to solve this. We know that C2 has to equal this. So we can substitute this expression for C2 right here. So we'll have C1 times the hyperbolic sine of this square root of lambda sub star uh, plus C2, which is uh, the square root of lambda sub star times C1 times the hyperbolic cosine of that uh, square root of lambda sub star, that's equal to zero. Okay, so we've got C1 here and here. You can factor that out. And the rest of it is just this.
Okay, so the only way that that's zero is if one of these factors is zero. I've got this times this equals zero. So either C1 equals zero or the second function is zero. of things I want you to notice. Um, when you're solving this equation, um, you might be solving for uh, lambda sub star if you can. Uh, that will allow us to find an eigenvalue, potentially an eigenvalue. Um, you want to remember that uh, lambda sub star is negative lambda and lambda was negative. So lambda sub star is just some positive number. So this is a positive number times the hyperbolic cosine of a positive number plus the hyperbolic sine of a positive number. Now it's helpful when solving this equation to remember what our hyperbolic sine function looks like. This is um, one half e to the x. This function is negative one half e to the negative x. The hyperbolic sine function looks like this. something like that, roughly. And the hyperbolic cosine function is this. It's, I always use the, the functions 1 half e to the x and 1 half e to the negative x to guide us. Hyperbolic cosine function looks like this. Notice that the hyperbolic cosine function is never zero. The hyperbolic sine function is only zero um, when the argument is zero. And what we're talking about here is a value of lambda sub star that is, is positive. So, so this number, the square root of lambda sub star is some, some number over here. So the hyperbolic cosine is gonna be a positive number. The hyperbolic sine is going to be a positive number. Um, so if I'm trying to, to solve this for uh, lambda sub star, um, I've got a positive number times a positive number plus a positive number equals zero. That's never going to happen. So let's write that down. Since hyperbolic sine of this is positive, of course this is positive because of our uh, initial um, definition of this lambda sub star and the hyperbolic cosine of that lambda sub square root of lambda sub star is positive. Since all of that is positive, there's no way we could add this together and get zero. I'm using EQN for equation. This equation has no solution. Okay. So this is zero or this is zero, this is never zero, therefore we can conclude that C1 is equal to zero. And if C1 is equal to zero, according to this equation, that means that C2 is this constant times zero. So C2 must be zero. So that means our function is the zero function, but that that is the solution to the boundary value problem um, in the case when lambda is negative. But we're not just looking for solutions to the boundary value problem. We're looking for non-zero solutions to the boundary value problem that correspond to particular values of lambda. Since we get a zero solution, that's not an eigenfunction. Since we're seeking eigenfunctions, f equals zero is not an option. That means that lambda is never negative. Or in other words, there are no negative eigenvalues. Briefly, I'd just like to review what we did. So we said in case one, Let's find the eigen, or let's find M1 and M2. 
and then find the corresponding linearly independent solutions. You can write them in terms of exponentials, or if they have opposite signs like this, I prefer to write them in terms of a hyperbolic sine and cosine functions. Look at your boundary conditions. If you've got a derivative in the boundary conditions, compute a derivative, and we did. And then we use this first boundary condition to come up with an equation that relates C1 to C2. So we found f of zero, we found f prime of zero, and then we came up the, with this equation. So it's one equation with two unknowns. To get the second equation with two unknowns, we use the second boundary condition, f of one is equal to zero. Now I've got two equations and two unknowns and you wanna solve that system. You can solve it in any, any number of ways. I, choose, I chose to use, in this case, the substitution method. I solved for C2 in terms of C1, and then I substituted that in. And then I ended up with this equation. And then I factored out the C1, and then we just solved this equation from there. Okay, um, so, so that's basically how you do it. You find the general solution to the differential equation, and then you use the boundary conditions to find a solution to the boundary value problem. We're going to find two equations and two un with two unknowns in general. Use the boundary conditions to find two equations with two unknowns. And then solve to find your C1 and C2. And then from there, you want to um, solve for um, the solution to the boundary value problem. Um, F. And that also involves finding the corresponding um, lambda, if there are any lambdas. Okay. So we did that this time for this case, we ended up um, we ended up somewhere that didn't particularly help us. That's okay. We can move on. It's always good to learn something. Sometimes if we feel like we've, um, we haven't made progress, actually we have. We find out something doesn't work, that's information. And that information can be very helpful to us. Okay, so we know that the lambda is actually not negative, not when we're talking about eigenvalues for this particular sturm liouville problem. Um, the next case was when lambda was equal to zero. That's gonna be our repeated real roots case. So M1 and M2 were originally plus and minus the square root of negative lambda and lambda is zero. So we've got plus and minus the square root of the opposite of zero, which is just zero. So again, M1 and M2 are both zero, so we've got repeated real roots. Okay, when you have repeated real roots, then we know that the first solution is e to the M1x, in this case, that's e to the zero x, or just a one. And the second linearly independent solution can't be e to the m2x because e to the m2x would just be e to the 0x, which is also 1. And 1 and 1 are obviously linearly dependent because they're exactly the same function. It turns out that the second linearly independent solution will be x times e to the m2x. And in this case, that just simplifies to x. Um, and that x can be found using reduction of order, as discussed in your elementary uh, differential equations class. So case two, we've got this. So you found your roots, you find the two linearly independent solutions. We're gonna call those F sub one and F sub two. And then you use those to construct the general solution, which is F equals C1 F1 plus C2 F2. C1 times one plus C2 times X in this case, because F1 is one and F2 is X. All right, so that's what we're dealing with. 
And the next thing we want to do is say, okay, well, this is a solution to the differential equation, but I'm looking for a solution to this uh, boundary value problem. Since it involves a derivative, um, I will compute the derivative of this. The derivative of C1 is just zero. The derivative of a constant times X is just our constant. And the first um, condition is this. We've got F prime of zero minus F of zero equals zero. Um, F prime of zero is just F, this function evaluated at zero, it's a constant function. So it's just gonna be that constant. And then F of zero is clearly the other constant. That's gonna be equal to zero. Now maybe I should show that work. F of zero is C1 plus C2 times zero, which is C1 and F prime of zero is C2. So this is just C2 minus C1 equals zero when I substitute into the boundary value, uh, that, that first um, boundary condition. Okay, so notice that this boundary condition tells us that C1 and C2 have to satisfy this. It doesn't actually give us the value this time, but it does tell us that C1 and C2 have to be equal to each other. So I'll just solve from here. C2 turns out to be equal to C1. Now the second boundary condition says that F of one is equal to zero. Now F of one is C1 plus C2 times one, or it's just C1 plus C2. And C2 is actually the same as C1. That's C1 plus C1, which is two times C1. Okay, so F of one turns out to be two times C1, given that, that this other condition is satisfied. And we're told that F of one is equal to zero. So we set this equal to zero and solve. Well, clearly that means that C1 is equal to zero. And since this equation is satisfied and C1 equals zero, that means C2 is equal to zero. And if C1 and C2 are both zero, that means we're dealing with the zero function. Okay, so there we are. Um, we had our, to use our boundary conditions to find two equations and two unknowns. We substituted and then we found um, the solution to the boundary value problem. All right, but again, we've got the zero function and the zero function is actually not a very uh, exciting function. We say it's a trivial function. And while it is a solution to the boundary value problem, it's not the solution that we're looking for because again, we are looking for eigenvec eigenvalues, excuse me, and eigenfunctions. And eigenfunctions are non-zero solutions to this boundary value problem that correspond to um, values of the parameter lambda, um, which are called eigenvalues. I'll just say we seek eigenfunctions, so this is unacceptable. Because it is, it's not acceptable as an eigenfunction. And that tells us that this case that we're in, case two, where lambda is equal to zero, um, does not correspond to an eigenvalue. So we'll say that lambda equals zero is not an eigenvalue. All right, so we're, we're finally into that last case. Hopefully the last case will yield some interesting functions. Hopefully we've got our, some eigenfunctions and eigenvalues from that last case. We'll see shortly what happens. In this case, we've got lambda is greater than zero. 
So M1 and M2 are equal plus or minus the square root of negative lambda. If lambda is positive, we have plus or minus the square root of lambda times I. Um, so that is a pair of complex conjugate roots. And recall that if M1 and M2 are equal to alpha plus or minus beta I, the two linearly independent solutions of the differential equation are e to the alpha x cosine of beta x. And a second function that looks just like it, but instead of a cosine, you've got a sine. Um, those are two real solutions to the differential equation. We could have answers in terms of these complex exponents, but we prefer to write our answers in terms of sine and cosine. So all the functions are real, real valued functions. Um, okay, so given that, uh, we need to identify alpha and beta. Alpha is the real part here. There is no real part, so we're just gonna call that zero. Beta is the, the positive constant multiplying i, which is the square root of lambda. And that means our two linearly independent solutions are e to the zero x times cosine of the square root of lambda times x, substituting in zero for alpha and square root of lambda for beta. So that's just cosine of the square root of lambda times x. And f2 looks just like f1, except you replace the cosine function with a sine function. All right, so you've got f1 and f2. And that means your general solution is c1 times f1 plus C2 times F2. You wanna find your M values, find F1 and F2, construct the general solution. All right, now after you've done all of that, you say, okay, I'm not just looking for the general solution of that second order differential equation. What I'm looking for um, are eigenfunctions. I want solutions that have this form that satisfy these initial or these boundary conditions. Since our boundary condition, our first boundary condition involves a derivative, we'll compute the derivative. Uh, the derivative of a constant times a cosine function is that constant times the derivative of cosine. The derivative of cosine of a function is negative one times sine of the inside function times the derivative of the inside, the derivative of a constant times x is just the constant. You pull that out. Okay, and then over here, bring your constant down and then multiply by the derivative of sine. The derivative of sine is cosine of the inside function. And then you multiply by the derivative of the inside. Okay, so that's our f prime. And in order to use our first boundary condition, which is that's, which says that f prime of zero minus f of zero is equal to zero. In order to use that, we need to evaluate f at zero and we need to evaluate f prime at zero. So here's f of zero. We get c1 cosine of zero plus c2 sine of zero. Cosine of zero is one, sine of zero is zero. So we get c1 times one plus c2 times zero, which is just c1, okay. And then at x equals zero for the second one, we've got negative square root of lambda times c1 times sine of zero, plus square root of lambda times c2 times cosine of zero. Sine of zero is zero, cosine of zero is one. So this ends up being square root of lambda times c2. All right, our condition says that f prime of zero minus f of zero has to be zero. So our condition is equivalent to this. Um, f prime of zero is the square root of lambda times c2. If we subtract f of zero from that, which is c1, we should get zero. So we've got one equation with two unknowns. This tells us how c1 and c2 have to be related to each other. You can solve this for one of the constants in terms of the other. I'll solve for c1. This is equivalent to saying that c1 is equal to the square root of lambda times c2. Okay, so I'll put a box around that. Just as a reminder, that's one of my equations. Now to get the second equation, I use the second condition. The second condition was the f of zero is, or f of one is equal to zero, excuse me. Um, now 
In our case, we've got f of 1 equals c1 times cosine of the square root of lambda times 1, which is just the square root of lambda, plus c2 times sine of square root of lambda times 1. Now we're told that this has to be 0. Now square root of lambda, or cosine and sine of square root of lambda don't simplify at all. Um, the, the value of that is going to depend on the value of lambda, and lambda is just some positive number. Uh, so this, you know, this could be any number between negative 1 and 1. This could be any number between negative 1 and 1. Uh, we know that sine squared plus cosine squared of that number is equal to 1, but that's really all we know. Um, so we've got this. It's just some expression involving lambda, and we have to set that equal to 0. In order for that second boundary condition to be satisfied, this must be zero. So that is our second equation. We've got two equations with two unknowns. From this, we see that we can replace C1 with square root of lambda times C2. And we see we've got a C2 in common here. So we can factor that out. I've got this times this equals zero, which means either the first factor is zero or the second factor is zero. Now, we hope we're not in this case, because if C2 equals 0, according to this, C1 would also be 0. Then we'd be de dealing with a 0 solution, and we don't want a 0 solution. We're looking for eigenfunctions, which are non-zero solutions. Um, so we hope we don't have to default to this case. We hope that this is 0 instead. Now, this can be 0. Now, remember what happened with case 1. In case 1, we had this expression, which looked very similar. But this was always positive, and we multiply by this positive number, and then we add this positive number. There's no way the sum of these two positive numbers could be zero. But sine and cosine are different. One of these could be negative, and the other one could be positive. And so everything could be negative and positive in just the right way that all of this stuff cancels out. Um, so um, because these could have opposite signs, we, we could very well get zero from this. Now. Um, I know that the square root of lambda is positive, um, but I don't know that this is non-zero and I don't know that this is non-zero. Um, so I think this is what I'll do. I'll say that the square root of lambda times cosine of square root of lambda equals um, negative uh, sine of the square root of lambda. And then we'll just restrict ourselves for the moment to the, the values where cosine of square root of lambda is not equal to zero. So we'll get this. And actually, I think I want to multiply both sides by negative one. So I've got negative one times the square root of lambda equals the tangent of the square root of lambda. Now that is a tough equation to solve. That, if I had a negative x here equals tangent of x, I couldn't solve that algebraically. This is what we call a transcendental equation. And that would be tough to solve for lambda. Um, let's just to simplify the, the situation, let's let a be the square root of lambda. In that case, if I graph tangent of A, it's gonna look like this. There's negative pi over two and pi over two and three pi over two and five pi over two and so on. It looks like this and like this and like this. And we keep going. So if this is the a axis, that's tangent of a. And this function on the other side, you might 
think of that as y equals negative a. Well, y equals negative a is going to look roughly like this. Of course, not to scale, right? It's supposed to be a straight line, y equals negative a. Now, I can't solve this equation algebraically, but I can see that I have infinitely many solutions. And we're, remember, lambda is positive, so square root of lambda is positive. Um, so the first value of a that we, we would get is this one. Get that, that we could call that a1, and the second one would be over here. We could call that a2. And then the next one would be somewhere over here. We would call that a3, and so on. So you're actually going to have infinitely many solutions to this. I can't write them all down. I can't solve for them algebraically, but I could use a computer um, to find the points of intersection of this uh, tangent function and this line y equals negative a, where a is the square root of lambda. Um, so um, we actually do have eigenfunctions and eigenvalues here. Um, those eigenfunctions and eigenvalues, though, are the, the solutions of this, or they relate to the solutions of this transcendental equation. Okay, so we can't exactly write down what lambda sub n is, but we can solve this equation for lambda in terms of a. So we'll have lambda equals a squared, where a is a solution of the equation negative a equals tangent of a. Um, and we actually have infinitely many solutions. So we could call those a sub n's and the corresponding values of lambda, uh, lambda sub n. And um, so the lambdas are these a sub n squared and a sub one is here, a sub two is there, a sub three is there and so on. Okay, so those are our eigenvalues. And our eigenfunctions, f sub n of x, are given by what? Let's see. Where is our general solution? So f of x is equal to this, and we know that c1 has to be equal to square root of lambda times c2. So f sub n of x is square root of lambda times c2 times the cosine of the square root of lambda times x plus c2 times the sine of the square root of lambda times x. So we know that that's true. We could factor out the C2 if we wanted to. Um, and then we want to replace our lambdas with these a sub n squared. Now a sub n are, um, these are solutions of this. And I guess we should state where a sub n is greater than zero. Um, in that case, the square root of lambda is just a sub n. So those are our f sub n, our eigenfunctions. Um, and you might not want this c2 here. It's really not necessary. So we would typically choose for that constant to be equal to one, and then we'd have our eigenfunctions. So we've got a sub n times cosine of a sub n x plus sine of a sub n x for n equals one, two, three, and so on. And lambda sub n is equal to a sub n squared. 
where a sub n is a solution of negative a sub n equals tangent of a sub n and a sub n is strictly greater than zero. Alrighty, so that's exactly what we're talking about. It's exactly what we're trying to find. Um, and we're done. So that is how we handle the case when we've got a transcendental equation. Um, you're just gonna find your lambda in terms of maybe some different parameter. I, I chose to use A, uh, but you wanna think about you know, whether or not that equation has a solution. Um, because in case one, where we were considering negative values of lambda, we ended up with an equation that never had a solution. Um, this is never equal to zero. But in this case, we have solutions. We just can't find them algebraically. Um, there are solutions to this, this transcendental equation where this line, the y values on this line, are equal to the y values on the tangent function. And those are hard to find algebraically. But they exist. Like, we can see them. We've got one here, another one here, another one there. We've got countably many solutions to this. We just can't really write them down. Um, so that's how you would handle that. Write your um, lambda sub n in terms of some second parameter. You might visualize the solutions to your transcendental equation. If you wanted to, you could actually use a computer to find a few values there. Um, and then once you have your values of lambda, you just substitute them into the form of your solution f of x. Replace the f of x with f sub n of x because now these depend on lamp or they depend on n. We actually have infinitely many eigenfunctions for each of those infinitely many eigenvalues. Um, and then that's it. Uh, be sure to specify the values of n uh, for which these functions, um, eigenfunctions and eigenvalues uh, satisfy the equation as well. That's our last example. Next time we will um, talk about um, some properties of the eigenfunctions of the solutions to the regular sturm liouville problems. And we'll talk about expanding other functions in terms of eigenfunctions. Um, or maybe we'll derive the um, eigenfunctions and eigenvalues uh, for the Fourier series. We'll see. We'll see in the next video what we decide to do.